Hey everybody, Mark Ahrensberg here with The Pure Now Show. This is episode number 30. My guest today is James Cross. James is a creative director at BBC Creative in the UK. He's been partnered up with Tim Jones for over 15 years, creating award-winning campaigns, coming up from the bottom all the way to the creative top. Here we go. Hey, James. Hi, Mark. How are you? I am super duper, thanks. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm a little tired. It's quite early here, but everything is good. Yeah, what time is it in merry ye old Manchester? It's just gone 8 a.m., which, because we're in lockdown, these days is actually quite early for me to actually be up and around. <laughs> oh, so you guys are you guys are in lockdown right now? Well, I say lockdown. I say we're working from home, so you've kind of, over two years, I've got from this habit of kind of being sort of around at 7 a.m. to sort of maybe getting out of bed more like 8.30 a.m. so I can be sat at my desk for, for nine minutes. So yeah, wow. it's a different it's a different world now for sure. Well, let me first say thank you for coming on the Pure Now Show. Totally appreciate you spending some time to chat with me and talk about your professional career and everything that's kind of going on with you. And and I didn't realize that you guys were still under some uh, restrictive movement there. I, I, oh. I, I was under the assumption that most of the world was kind of freely moving about. So what's... what's... No, we are, no it, it, we are pretty much with free. There's the odd place that has to wear a mask, but COVID doesn't exist in the UK, according to the government anymore. Uh, according to the government, but what about according to you? What is going on according to you, James? Uh, well, I mean, it's a different world in terms of um, we. There's a, a hybrid model in terms of working, so nobody is is in the office five days a week, for example. At the BBC, we operate a sort of two plus three model, where it's two days in the office, three days from home. So it is a very different world and obviously that brings its own challenges and you know benefits too. I think the older you are the more benefits it has. The younger you are in terms of you know learning from other people I think there's there's probably things that my generation took for granted like you know having more senior more experienced people around to come and you know tell you what's what and, and stuff. So you know, I think it's harder for the, the younger generations coming into the industry. But, you know, from my point of view, there are a lot of benefits in terms of my, the, your work-life balance. I think a, a lot of people are finding that's brilliant. There's no, you know, we're not commuting for two, three hours a day and, and things like that. So, yeah, I quite like it. But, yeah, there are there's certainly challenges in the industry. Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit. How has it potentially negatively impacted you professionally, although maybe it's benefited you personally in having this kind of separation of church and state where you've got this time for yourself and uh, you feel that it's more balanced. How has that affected uh, working for the BBC and delivering work to clients, meeting with clients, working with deadlines, client management, all that has shifted I mean, it was moving in that direction anyway, but now everything is so solidified in that way. How do you feel that that's affected your work? I don't know if it's affected the work massively. I mean, we kind of we kind of never know in a way. I think we, we still operate under the same processes. We, um, with the sort of creative department, you know, the, the way Tim, my, my creative, co-creative director and I run our teams, you know, things haven't changed massively in, in that sense, I suppose. What we lack is every meeting we have is formal now. There's no, you know, catching someone in a corridor and then suddenly you hear something or being inspired or making certain changes have to wait to, for very scheduled meetings. Whereas I think I always enjoyed, you know, being able to float around a department and, you know, chatting to someone over a coffee or, like I say, just seeing them at the, at the sort of copier machine and just, you know, you could just say something and you'd hear something. So that's hard. I think the level of distractions are hard. I have um, ADHD, so it's kind of being at home can also be a bit of a nightmare in terms of there are a million things to distract me. So I have to really get in the zone in order to sort of work and concentrate. So that I do find that a challenge. You know, not having a, a not leaving the house. I suppose from a mental health point of view, being at home all the time is great, and then you kind of crave, you know, other 
environment. So I don't strictly adhere to the two days in the office thing. I sometimes might be in three or four or, you know, go somewhere, go and sit in a coffee shop for the day and I'll work from there. But yeah, so it certainly brings its challenges. A bit, but I think there are also positives. I think I'm certainly, I'd say physically a lot healthier than when we were in the office full time. I think the work we do, like I say, hasn't necessarily been affected, but it's certainly influenced it. You are a, a, a product of your environment. So I'd say the work that the BBC have, have done, BBC Creative, we always have to reflect the culture going on around us. And, and we've done that quite well. So there are certain pieces of work that perhaps in times gone by, we may not have been inspired to write, but equally, I, I sometimes wonder if there's stuff we would have done that we haven't done because you know, we, were, we are in the situation we're in. We're very much into uh, designing experiences for our shows on the BBC. So we kind of say it's like, we don't want to just be preaching to the choir all the time and putting out promotions which appear on our own TV channels and radio stations. So that has certainly been affected by the, the, the change in the world. It's, you know, initially when there were restrictions, it was harder to sort of do these things and we had to think cleverly about them. So we don't just want to do billboards, for example, we want to create those billboards as some sort of experience and something that people are going to share and it's, you know, going to have PR value. But obviously that's hard to do when everyone's, everyone's locked in their, their houses. Well, and with the predominance of social media, you've kind of had to shift your focus into leveraging that massive audience. How has that yeah. changed the way you think about producing work, uh, the style of work, maybe the length because of attention span yeah. deficit disorder that the world yeah, pretty yeah. much has at this point? Um, how have you tailored the kind of work that you're doing to present these projects for the BBC so you can get the net results that you're looking for? Well, I mean, in terms of the sort of the general approach, um, we, we're no longer, I would say, a TV first agency where everything we used to do was all about sort of the big TV production. There's always a need for that and an always a, a need to do it well, but whatever we do, I think if we're making, especially making TV, I love nothing more than crafting something to a point where everyone else would have stopped just going a little bit too far because that's kind of where the magic happens and, you know, people become very interested in, in what you're doing if, you know, your, your production technique is, you know, slavish and way way more involved than it probably needs to be we put massive pressure on ourselves but you know it nine times out of ten creates magic and i think in terms of durations of of what we make uh, certainly shorter we work closely with you know tiktok and and facebook and and youtube we regularly have their their creative teams consult with us just to tell us what's the the best way to approach things what you know how important is that first five seconds if we're making a pre-roll for example what kind of attention spans are we dealing with on tiktok which for example which is is super frightening you know that's not even five seconds it's less than that and it's just interesting it's good to know it's great as a creative to know your parameters because i think that focuses your attention and you know, you work within that space. And I, I always think restrictions on a creative are, are good things. So yeah, it's making way more work that that is social first is certainly the biggest difference. And maybe an, an enforced change that was coming anyway, it certainly happened faster than, than I, I think anyone thought it would. And because of that, I mean, the viewing audience is massive. So your mm. impact actually, even in four seconds, may have a far more reaching uh, effect of nabbing an audience than previous TV advertising, just because the massive numbers uh, that you're reaching versus the, the more narrow field of television advertising. So is there some kind of a balance there where you're actually getting the results that you want because of the increase in numbers, even though your window of 
of display is shortened. It, has there been some kind of a, an adjustment in that? Uh, I think um, there certainly has. I mean, I'm always, maybe, I'm always quite skeptical of, of figures for, viewing figures for on social. I think, you know, things are recorded. You know, you do, there's no guarantee of someone's attention. But yes, in terms of the viewing figures, which is essentially how we measure everything at the BBC, they have they have been strong. They've got they've got stronger. Um, I'd like to think the way we've we now approach um, advertising and, and promoting our, our shows has something to do with that, of course. But uh, yeah, I mean, we still we still make the the longer form the longer form work. But yeah, there, there's certainly the work we've done. I would say organically is is more shareable. And that's probably comes as a result of being, you know, so social first. Right. Well, let's go backwards a bit. Uh, you evidently started in the music business before you did <laughs> much. And it sounds like you had some fun for a little while, not doing a whole mm. lot, but being in an environment, uh, music, you were obviously super into the music scene. Um, yes. Yeah, sure. how, how did you, one, how did you get there? And, and were you yeah. raised in Manchester? Or is that your hometown? No, my, my hometown is Northampton, which is in kind of, it's hot, it's kind of halfway between Birmingham and London. Um, so it's a bit of a nowhere town. Um, it's a, it's a big town, but there's no reason to go there really, uh, you know, everyone leaves kind right. of place. So it's kind of, I was always frustrated growing up, you know, wanted to live in a city, Manchester, especially, um, through music, it's got such a rich musical heritage um, with, you know, bands from, you know, Joy Division, New Order, right through to today. It's like a really buzzing scene and it's always, for a small town boy, it's been massively exciting and, and still is. And that, and, you know, I've always, I've always loved music. Growing up, uh, I wanted to, I was fascinated by Croatian Records and a guy called uh, Alan McGee, who signed bands like Oasis, who were hugely popular. You know, it wasn't necessarily the, the I love the music, but I was always fascinated by the, the business side of it. And I always thought it was super cool that you could, you know, have an office job and wear sunglasses all day if you really wanted to. And I worked there, as a student, I used to go in once a week to Pop Tones, which Creation Records closed down and became Pop Tones, and they were in London. And there, I was just I was just making tea and unpacking bags, and then later realised that I may have been unaware that I was a bit of a, a drugs mule. I was regularly sent to random addresses in North London to pick up packages, which I told were T-shirt samples or record samples. <laughs> and then bring them back to the office, which was all a bit strange, and I was very naive. Um, and then I worked at a, a label called Shifty Disco Records, which uh, everyone was generally pretty high all the time. So my office hours were at um, 11 a.m. till 2 p.m. <laughs> and I think my dad realized that this was no way, to, no way to be. And I think at one point it was costing me more to go to work than I was actually making in a day. So I decided, um, Having written lots of, I used to do lots of press releases for them with no, I've got no training in that. I just confidently took that job on. Um, and that got me a very strange interview with a chap called Mike Johnson, who, who gave me my first ad agency job. I didn't really know what advertising was or what, certainly what the business of advertising entailed at that point. And, um, yeah, I left Shifty Disco um, on a Friday night and started at BNB on Monday morning. Wow. Shifty should have been the giveaway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was chaos. <laughs> but remarkably, it still, it still kind of exists. So, um, wow. yeah, more power to them. Yeah. So you did, so you went into the field of copywriting and uh, mm -hmm. uh, how did you mature in that? How did you become inspired to continue down that path and and become you know more in charge of the creative scene yeah um i suppose uh i started off writing um sort of local what they call dealer ads for for saab um uh, the swedish car brand um so it's kind of low level-ish work and i suppose i learned 
the trade by becoming very nerdy about it very quickly. So, you know, a, a party trick of mine was always, you know, every DNA, D annual from say 1990 to you know 2005, I could pretty much tell you where, where certain pieces were, what page they were on, um, you know, who wrote it. Um, so I studied, I studied other people's work you know, I would read avidly and lift phrases out of books and, you know, I'd learn that way. And obviously Mike Johnson was a, a real mentor who, you know, real, really was quite strict on me in many ways. And, it, you know, it was really good. The other way I suppose I matured and within as being a junior, I was made, I was made, my business cards were always said senior copywriter on them because I was teamed with an art director who was 20 years older than me and he didn't want me going into meetings with a, a business card that said junior copywriter on them. So I had to grow up very quickly. So I suppose I was seen as maybe more experienced than I actually was in those early years. I wore glasses that I didn't really need to make me look slightly older. And, you know, I've always been a believer in kind of fake it till you make it. So it kind of it, it carried me through with you know, this self-confidence that I was able to sort of bring to the fore we were presenting and, you know, certainly served as well. But my ambition was always to work in TV and this was doing, you know, like localised car advertising for, like I say, Saab. We did some for uh, Vauxhall, which is another General Motors brand. And, you know, it went well. We were able to do a little bit of TV um, and we were just, I suppose, um, we were just aggressive at the time in terms of we were the agency that did all the small stuff and we'd regularly meet with Lowe in, in London who were doing all the sort of the big sort of brand advertising stuff and challenged the client that, can we, you know, can we have a go at this? Can we, we do it? And eventually we did break through and, you know, change, change the agency really. They, they were quite lethargic as a, an agency at the time who were working on Saab at, you know, that brand level. I've always, you know, I suppose it's maybe not being in London all the time. It's you have that desire just to prove yourself and, you know, you, you kind of always, always ready to show, you know, show the world what you can do because when you're not in London or you're, you know, you're not in New York or whatever, you, you ha kind of have to, I feel, fight for those opportunities. As a, as a junior creative, you're not working on the, you know, the sexy brands. You're, you're kind of doing the shit that nobody else wants to do. So, you know, we're, we're in itself are opportunities. But so we've always, you know, Tim and I, especially since we've been working together, have taken that very seriously. And that's always, you know, got us in the, the right rooms with the right people. It's it's all about attitude, which I think, you know, success in the creative industry is really is.